Hi, everyone, and welcome to Mountain Travel Symposium's second edition of our COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Kat Shaw, the Director of Marketing and Content for MTS, and I will be your host today. Before we begin, I just wanted to run through a couple of features that we have on the webinar. Uh, we'll be doing Q&A. You can feel free to submit your questions throughout the entire webinar and all of our panelists are going to incorporate those questions into their conversation. Um, we will have time at the end for any questions that do come up at the end or uh, ones that are not addressed during the live webinar. There's also a chat feature which you can use um, to talk to other attendees. Uh, we won't be monitoring the chat for Q&A, so just make sure that you submit your questions via the Q&A feature. And then we'll also have a couple of polls throughout the webinar. So make sure that you respond to those because they'll, they'll be a part of our discussion. And then at the end, uh, we'll have a survey there. The survey will open up in your browser. So just make sure that you fill that out because that'll give us a lot of feedback as far as uh, new topics and um, the effectiveness of this webinar. So, with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today for our webinar titled Mountain Tourism in the Age of COVID-19, What the Data Tells Us. We have an esteemed list of panelists today, uh, including Dave Bielan, the Director of Consulting Services for RRC Associates, Pete Como, the Managing Director of Focusrate, Tom Foley, the Senior Vice President of Business Process and Analytics for Intopia, and Ali Hoyt, the Senior Director of Consulting and Analytics for STR. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And with that, I am going to launch our first poll question to get everything started. So our poll question to kick things off is, as a business, what is your biggest concern? Bottom line, health and safety of staff and guests, customers fear of travel, reoccurrence of government required shutdown, marketing and communications to guests, and snow quality during winter 2020 slash 2021. <clears throat> All right, so let's see our results here. And then I'm going to hand it over to the group to start discussing. All right, guys, what are your thoughts on that? Perfect, thanks, Kat. I, I think really interesting to see snow quality not have a single re respondent because that would have been the top of the list um, uh, for the past decade or so. So I, I took a snapshot of this, uh, a screen grab, and, and I think we can refer to it as we go along. Um, but uh, why don't you start, Kat, uh, flip to the next slide. And just to set the scene for how we're going to structure this webinar today. So we're going to start with a data frame and um, you know, we'll start from a macro view and kind of dig down and, and end up with a, with a micro view. And the point of this webinar is not for us to speak to you um, with just data. It's for us to share some data, to just frame a conversation. And we'd love to uh, insert your questions throughout the uh, webinar. So please uh, uh, ask as you go. And once we get through the data piece, which should be about 15, 15 to 20 minutes or so tops. Then we'll just dig into some of the hot topics that are, are shaping um, mountain tourism today. So, um, so this particular chart uh, is, is kind of a standard uh, focus right chart. We've been sizing uh, the travel industry for, for over two decades. And as you can see, uh, we, we experienced a, a, quite a spike of growth after the Great Recession and then settled into a pretty consistent, uh, healthy, expanding industry, I'd say, since 2012. And as we kind of turned the decade, we were at 
uh, a total of $400 billion for the U.S. market. Um, and as you're looking at growth, if you consider U.S. real GDP growth during the same time frame hovered right around 2% annually, travel has consistently out performed the overall uh, economy by roughly 2x over the last decade. So all in all, a really, really healthy decade for travel. Um, although as we kind of turned the corner here from, from, uh, from the 10s to the 20s, uh, we did decline a little bit. And I think that was just reflective of fears of, of a potential looming economic slowdown uh, that occurred in, in late 2019. But Americans were still planning their vacations up until mid-March. Uh, over the course of a, a couple of weeks, I would say the industry literally shut down and travelers went from planning to postponing. And as we move on to the next slide, uh, we start to see how U.S. travelers reacted uh, early on in the, uh, uh, in the, 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 the slowdown or, or shutdown, I suppose. Uh, so this data comes from a, a survey that we fielded in late March. So it's important to kind of, you know, put an asterisk on it because consumer sentiment uh, has obviously changed quite significantly and continues to evolve. But I think this is an interesting way to at least give us a baseline of how travelers reacted initially um, as the industry went from a period of growth uh, to complete shutdown. So we see some trends developing here. Uh, 65 to 70% of those older than, than 35 either postponed or canceled their trip. So obviously quite a dramatic um, you know, figure there as far as cancellations go. But as we look at the younger generation, uh, they tended to, uh, to hold off a little bit. So nearly 43% of them kept their trip uh, on the calendar. And again, this was late March, so this has probably evolved a little bit. Um, as travel restrictions tightened. Um, but, you know, as of late March, they either kept their trip fully intact or they changed only a portion of it. So this is going to be a key demographic to keep our eyes on as we bounce off the bottom, which I think we, we might have, have just done relatively recently. And we'll see that in some of the other data sets. Uh, and, and as we start moving into early, uh, early recovery. So that begs the question, what will stimulate travel demand as we move from a negative travel situation where cancellations have outnumbered new bookings uh, to early recovery? So as we change slides, we see that deals um, are not necessarily at the top of the list for stimulating travel. So, uh, you know, deals have, have always been a tool that suppliers have used to, to stimulate travel. But as we look at at the US and key Western Europe markets, we see that less than one third of travelers are highly likely uh, to take advantage of travel deals. And the Brits, which is probably not, uh, not surprising, are least likely to do that. So travelers are, are, as a whole um, are likely more concerned with health and safety uh, than good prices and good prices won't be enough to stimulate demand. But as we start to dig a little bit deeper into the data, uh, on the next slide, we see some differences uh, across age groups. So back to the millennials, uh, younger millennials and Gen Z travelers, this is a demographic that can be stimulated by leisure travel bargains. So this slide indicates why targeted messaging and offers is critical because uh, it's possible to drive bookings by offering deals to younger travelers. However, you also sacrifice margin with the middle age and older travelers who aren't as concerned about getting a deal and likely more concerned with uh, some of the, you know, the bigger topics of safety, security, cleanliness, et cetera. So as we move on to the next slide, and this is kind of a summary of some of the key findings from that survey that we fielded in, in late March. Um, this kind of helps us understand what leisure travelers are looking for in order to feel comfortable traveling again. So, you know, the first trend, clearly we're getting into safety, security, cleanliness, anything that will, um, that you can communicate that you're, 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 you're lessening the risk of them catching and spreading COVID. Uh, that is, that is really key. Uh, government restrictions clearly playing a, a role. And I think that's, Maybe the most challenging piece as we all look at our data sets um, as far as kind of forward looking is 
we have no idea when restrictions will be you know removed so it's really hard to predict what and when the recovery is going to look like and then lastly um, travelers want the destination to be open to do the things that they want to do on holiday so they don't want to travel if they can't eat at restaurants um, experience local activities etc so this is just a quick snapshot of what's going on in the general market and how travelers in general are looking at and thinking about um, what's going to stimulate them to travel. So as we transition from the general travel market, we're going to first zero in on the hotel segment and I'm going to pass it along uh, to Ali from Smith Travel Research to talk through some hotel data and trends. Ali, virtual baton to you. Thanks, Pete. Um, it probably it goes without saying that these are unprecedented times in the hospitality industry for the 30 plus years that STR has been tracking performance data in the U.S. We've never seen declines like this. And in the U.S., when we started to see COVID cases ramping up in March and as Pete mentioned, travelers canceling trips or postponing them, we had a lot of clients calling and asking, you know, what did the last two downturns look like? What was 2001 like in the hospitality industry or 2009? We were fielding a lot of those requests and then quickly realized as March data was coming in that this was like nothing we'd ever seen before. And it's a really challenging thing to try to compare to those past downturns and recoveries because this is so different for a lot of the reasons that Pete mentioned. Um, so for the week ending May 2nd in the U.S. hotel industry, Revpar declined 76.8%, and that's actually slightly less of a decline. Um, we think that the bottom or trough of the declines in performance for the U.S. hotel industry um, was April 11th, the light purple bars on this chart. Overall, Revpar for the U.S. declined 83.6%, and that was around three weeks of 80% Revpar declines, and we've started to see things get a little bit better over the past three weeks. This is looking at data by class, and as you can see, there's been RevPAR declines, significant declines across, across all property types. No property type has been immune from the declines that we've seen in travel. On the upper end of full-service hotels, luxury and upper upscale hotels, those two types of hotels are running single-digit occupancies for several weeks, which is, again, unlike anything we've seen before. Now, those two types are around 13 to 14% occupancy, so again, seeing a little improvement. But without group travel, high-end leisure travel, um, both of those demand sources have really evaporated. It's a challenge to fill full-service hotels. On the lower end, economy and mid-scale hotels are performing a little bit better. Um, economy hotels are still seeing occupancies of about 40% and mid-scale around 30%. And we know that there's just We've never looked at this data point before, but now that we've seen, as I mentioned, group travel evaporate, high-end leisure, there aren't a lot of people flying and traveling. We're now seeing what that, for the first time, what the baseline of demand is for the U.S. hotel industry. The industry is still selling about 1 million rooms a night in the industry. Um, so that's things like first responders due to the crisis that's going on right now, specific to this. We've seen several states um, putting forth initiatives to house homeless populations in hotels, people driving across the country, airline crews, people living in hotels. So we're seeing just that baseline of demand exist in the industry. Um, Kat, if you can go to the next slide. Um, my second and final slide is looking at data for China, the U.S., and Europe. Um, so this is a question we're, we're also getting is looking at the recovery in China and what can we expect across the U.S. and Europe as we look towards the recovery. Of course, China felt the effects of this virus first. So what we did here using STR's global database was overlay occupancy performance for these three regions. What we can tell from this chart is two things right now. Um, one, that light blue line is China, and we are seeing a slow but recovery of occupancy in China. Um, that's right around just over 30 to 40 percent occupancy across the country of China right now. The second thing that we can see from this chart is right in the middle, um, the U.S. is about six weeks behind China in terms of occupancy. Um, so at the end of March, China was around a 28 percent occupancy is where the U.S. is sitting today. 
So the real question is, will this trajectory continue of seeing this recovery in the U.S. follow that similar trend line to China? There's still a lot that we don't know and will remain unknown about the recovery in the U.S., um, but we will touch on, on some of those recovery topics in the discussion. And I will turn it over to Dave to share some of his data. Okay, great. Thanks, Allie. And, um, you know, interesting and unprecedented times, as you mentioned. Um, as, as we saw in the um, uh, poll, uh, snow conditions next winter is the, the least of people's concerns right now. Um, but when we did something similar as, as Allie did with the hotel industry, with the ski resort industry, looking, working with NSAA and uh, the mountain resorts that we work with, to try to look back historically at recessions or low snow seasons or other, other uh, impacts that have had um, you know, negative effects on the business of mountain resorts in the wintertime. Um, and you know, I, would, I would echo what Ali said is, you know, we, we found some patterns, but there's some very unprecedented times right now when it comes to unemployment rates that, that Tom will talk about in, in a few minutes, as well as a whole other um, unprecedented concerns. You all mentioned that your biggest concerns were the health and safety of your staff and your customers, and that your customers are fearful of travel. And so th th these concerns are really unprecedented. But when we look at skier visits historically, we've got 40 years of um, skier visit and then snowfall data. Um, I would I would point out three three things when we look at, at skier visits. One is that um, you know we don't have we don't yet have our preliminary skier visit number for the 1920 season. Typically, we are coming out with that number right about now, but we've been significantly delayed in the data collection from our ski resorts as they are struggling to to gather all their information and dealing with lots of other things. But that we're we're definitely going to be interested to see how these numbers vary by region of the country and by type of ski area and the, the, the differential effects that the early closure uh, right about mid-March has had on the ski resort industry. Um, secondly, I would also say that, um, you know, we, we've said a lot in the past that really snowfall is the primary driver of skier visits and business and mountain resorts in the wintertime and the economy is a secondary factor. Um, I would, I would point out that that also varies by region, by type of ski area, and by type of customer. And so more local and day visitors are the most highly correlated with snow conditions. Longer distance domestic out-of-state travelers are actually more correlated with the unemployment rate, um, whereas international travelers are most correlated with the exchange rate. So there are, when you start drilling down, there are various factors that have more or less impact on various customer segments. And, and third, uh, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier, which is that, um, you know, this is really unprecedented and looking historically at how the industry has responded to various down years, which in fact, the industry has rebounded typically following a down year. Uh, we will just have to see how this one goes because there really isn't a, an analog when you look back into the historical records. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I think there's a lot of different data points that, have, that are out there that probably a lot of you have been looking at and just briefly looking at other studies and other industries, um, I think we can learn some things. One, um, this study that Destination Analysts has done that seems to indicate that by July, starting really in July, August, September, Travelers are really starting to think I'm going to be um, getting back to, to a trip by the time uh, July comes around. So we'll see, we'll see what happens, obviously, this fluid situation that we're all in. Uh, but this, this chart would seem to suggest that maybe this summer there will be interest in traveling. Again, the concern of the health of, of your visitors as well as your staff and, and how you're adapting to dealing with bringing people to your destination. Uh, you know, the next slide, I think, is another industry that we can learn from uh, or another um, set of data that is really interesting that, that we found was the Boston Consulting Group put out, has put out a dashboard that's got lots of great information, airlines, travel, surveys. It's got different countries 
uh, Canada, UK, Germany, Italy, France, and China. So you can really drill into this um, Tableau dashboard. But this is just the most recent consumer sentiment that they looked at. And this is not specific to mountain resorts particularly, but you can see that there's a spectrum of concerns that travelers have, whether it's traveling internationally or taking a cruise where two thirds are saying, I would be pretty concerned about doing that right now, down to the, the right end where it's more, more closer to home things like ordering food or shopping online, there's less concern. And you can see the various activities that are most concerning to travelers in general. I think there's differences with mountain resorts and there have advantages uh, when it comes to having more outdoor activities we, we, and, and emphasizing the outdoor fresh air versus the indoor cruise or, or taking a flight, those things you're kind of trapped inside um, with other folks. Um, and then finally, the, the next slide looks at the golf industry. And I think we can really learn how they're, what, what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they've responded. Um, you know, uh, up, up to over 90% of golf courses are back open now. And you can see the National Golf Foundation has a great dashboard where they're tracking not only operations of golf courses, but also sentiment of golfers in terms of their participation in that activity. And it's not a perfect uh, analog to, to ski resorts or to mountain resorts or summer. But for those of you who have golf courses, I'm sure you're um, uh, making adjustments and making changes to react to the situation. Um, so I think looking at Southern Hemisphere, ski areas that's been mentioned on, on a couple of other calls I've been on, looking at um, just, just other examples of, of um, how, we, how resorts can react and respond and get back to business is really gonna be helpful. And I think Tom is gonna jump in and dig into some of his numbers and tell us how he sees the world. I am, thanks Dave, uh, appreciate it. Interesting to see the golf course numbers. I am doing my downtime in Southern California in Palm Springs. And while California has opened up golf courses, individual jurisdictions actually are keeping a lot of them closed. So Palm Springs itself is, is holding the option to keep things closed for the time being. This is an area with 250,000 people and 67 golf courses. So it's a big deal around here. Other parts of the valley here have, uh, have all their courses open and uh, are reporting, you know, moderate business, not brisk, but moderate, mostly locals. <clears throat> and, and tourism is, of course, not happening here. So whether or not they could actually fulfill capacity is something else altogether. I wanted to uh, tee up some stuff that I did actually in a webinar yesterday as well. So if you attended that, uh, pardon me for redundancy, but I think it's germane, it's important to tee up the conversation. Uh, around the greater economy and some of the things that we're seeing as well as the Entopia booking data. And on, on the left-hand side of the screen here, we really have uh, weekly jobless claims. And uh, I, I wish I had a, a better word than unprecedented, but I don't uh, to describe this because we're going to be using it a lot, it seems. But weekly jobless claims have been uh, dramatic, to say the very least. And uh, every single week equaling all of the jobs that were lost over the course of the 2008-9 uh, Great Recession. On the right hand side of the screen is a cumulative look at that and we see that it's starting to do something that resembles a leveling out but again the, the absurdity of the numbers is what's shocking. Uh, with 14.7 uh, percent um, official unemployment across the country and projections up to as high as 22.6% when you take into account the period of time that's not covered by the most recent survey and so forth. We've got essentially one fifth of the workforce currently not earning a paycheck, relying on government assistance or other systems that might be in place to help them out, assuming that those are working and frankly concerned about other things like putting food on the table and making sure that you know when they reemerge, they can still pay their rent if they get a, a, a three months worth of rent check back and so forth. So there's, there's concern about that. And as, as jobless claims go down, uh, that's still adding to the top. We're not gonna be looking at positive job growth in a while, but the concern that, that I've got here, and we'll go into more detail on it later, is the pace at which there are expectations of these returning. Uh, I, I think we're, we're talk, talk, talking about a long window. As I say, we'll go into details on it in, in a couple of minutes, but it is at the core of consumerism. Uh, job security, income security, 
uh, it drives a huge part of consumer confidence and consumer confidence when consumers are confident suppliers are in great shape and they control the marketplace when consumers are not confident we have to respond to them in terms of rate or value add or other things to get them to travel uh, and and all the other components that we've since talked about such as health and, and security so um, this is a very very big hole to dig out of and it impacts everything about our fulfillment process so that's number one if can't you can go forward um, but when we look at the Intopia data, we do actually see some positives. And so it's important to note the long term of what's taking place. And, and like Ali's data, we've been watching things over time and setting these benchmarks and dates. And Pete's doing the same thing in his last as well. And if we go back and take a look at the net bookings process through the Intopia system, this is at 1,700 destination properties or so, primarily in mountain communities, so very germane to this group. Uh, everything to the right. Uh, of the center line there is positive bookings, net positive. In other words, book, new bookings are outpacing cancellations. And those were fairly standard back January 1 to 8 during that week, averaging about 1,300 transactions per day going through the system as bookings. Uh, and, and you can see very clearly what happened uh, when the pandemic was declared and when we had a national emergency and when the ski resorts primarily closed down. It's about a 48 hour period in which most of that happened and cancellations took over. Uh, but there's some positive things that we see. And one is that the volume of cancellations has actually returned mm -hmm. to a more normal state. It's identifiable. It looks like cancellation volume that we saw prior to the pandemic and last year. So that's good. So now we're just poised waiting for the consumers to return. And in the last two weeks, you can see at the top of that, we're nudging just slightly to the positive. And so there are in fact more bookings taking place than cancellations. Um, so that's, that's a, a hint that we've got the initial shock factor that was driving the cancellations out of the way. And that's really helpful. And we'll hope that there are no more shock events to, to take that back towards a negative. But it's on a knife edge right now. Um, and uh, on the next slide, what we really see is another hopeful piece, which is around ADR, or average daily rate if you're not a, a hotelier. And this is, again, at that same group of properties. And if we look at how ADR has held up over time, there are a couple of stories here. But for each data set, you, you progress a dark bar to a light bar, and the dark bar is further ago. So bookings through the Entopy system as of February 15th for each of those arrival months. And you can see what the rate was at the beginning or at back in February 15th. And then you can see it as of April 30th. An average daily rate is really holding up quite a bit. Um, for those months that are shorter arrival. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions, but as we get out towards November, it gets a little bit more varied. And as the rates get higher, we're getting into a position of negotiating rate with customers and having to drive that higher dollar commitment. But, but overall, we're looking at only a five or 6% decline in aggregate, driven mostly by the big decline that we see in January. Um, and that's really, really positive. To uh, Ali's point, we've also gone back and looked and days at past events to try to find, you know, an analog for what's going on right now. And there isn't one, but we do know what happened with rate and revenue coming out of those. I believe the hotel recovery rate, and, and Ali, you can correct me, was somewhere around 36 to 42 months for hotels to get back where they were to pre-shock event. In the case of, of the properties reporting through the Destimetric system and mountain resorts, that was 62 months for the non-hotels to get back. And so the fact that we're managing to hold rate at this early stage in the, in the ramp back up to business is good news to help maybe avoid that huge, um, that huge valley that was out there. The other thing that we're tracking, though, is a reticence on the part of uh, consumers. And the next slide is going to show us um, sort of some booking patterns of what we see going on. One of the, what's happening is there's this push out. Consumers are they're wanting to book. They're wanting to come in May, June, July, but they're reticent to do it. And so we're seeing cancellations and cancellations are now occurring for June, July and August. So on the left hand side of this, um, what we see is at the top left, these are outright cancellations and the arrival date of those cancellations. And June is the most prominent cancellation currently taking place. A month ago, it was May, 
the month before that, and, and so on and so forth. It was April. So June, July, and August are seeing the most outright cancellations. And down at the bottom on the left-hand side, these are the cancellation, the arrival dates of transactions that are rebooking that they were originally scheduled to arrive in June, July, and August. Uh, in descending order. So the closer in the arrival date, the more cancellations we're seeing. And if you click again, Kat, that will take us to the next side, which is the bookings. And on the top right is rebookings, or is new bookings, pardon me. And new bookings are really coming in for July, but the second most common is further out, September through December, for new arrivals. And then August, and then a little bit in June. So now we're seeing a push that is later out for bookings than the cancellation dates we're seeing that are closer in. And the bottom right is showing us the new arrival dates of the rebookings from the bottom left, which are September to December and then August and then January 21 through April 21 and then some July. So those that are, that are rebooking are, are canceling their June, July, August days and they're coming in September, August and January all the way through. <clears throat> and what that does is it's creating what we're seeing as 120 day window to what we call normal data. So this following slide shows you the last three instances of daily occupancy levels. And I won't go into the details of how to read the slide, uh, other than to say these are snapshots as of the uh, over 15 day periods for each of our last three periods, going from April 30th uh, back to March 15th and then March 1st. And what we're seeing here is that 45 days ago, it was 116 days out to get to normal data patterns. 30 days ago, it was 122 days out to normal data patterns. This month, we're seeing 121 days out to normal data patterns. I expect this pattern to maintain at least until a couple of things happen. A few people get a job is part of it. Consumers get more confident. And of course, all those things that you guys have concerns about around health and safety and, and confidence in travel um, and, and so forth by the consumer. So that's, that's the window that we're seeing as far as patterns go. So there's some hopeful stuff, but there's a lot of concern in there as well. Um, and with that, that's my tee up and let's hand it over to the group. And uh, I think there might be another poll coming up. Kat, you wanna tee that up? Kat, you're on mute too. All right. So our next poll question is, as a business, what is your biggest opportunity? Pent up demand to travel, a chance to differentiate, capturing new clients, improvement of health and safety standards, becoming more locally focused, <clears throat> relieving overcrowding, changing DMO and town tax slash funding mechanisms. So if everyone could answer our poll so we can have a discussion on that. Lots of choices. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and we're wrapping that poll up and sharing the results. It looks like pent up demand for travel is the biggest opportunity this group sees. Yeah, yeah, that's that's not surprising. Uh, that's not surprising to me. I, I think we're already starting to see it, and maybe we can kind of transition into uh, the roundtable discussion at this point. So if everyone wants to jump off mute, um, interesting data that that I saw that came out yesterday, and I, I know we've kind of brainstormed four different topics that that we want to surface during this discussion, but maybe lodging is a good one to start with because. Um, you know, as we talk about pent up demand, um, all the rooms reported yesterday. So a, a kind of a data aggregator that looked at short term rental data that they saw a pretty nice bounce um, in particular with Airbnb data. Um, and that might indicate more of a V shaped recovery. I think that's way overly optimistic. I think it might be pent up demand of people that are just itching to get out of their house. Um, and, you know, maybe there will be a short term spike um, spike of bookings for people to get out. I think the short term rental category is probably one that's going to recognize that because, um, you know, more isolated, less people 
Um, but I'm not sure that sort of uh, pent up demand is going to continue. I think it's I think we're in in for a longer uh, a longer road for uh, to to recovery. So I, I'd be anxious to hear what the rest of you think about that. Yeah, I I'm inclined to agree about the longer road, Pete. There, you know, uh, there is a pent up demand, but I think it's it's relative to uh, standard demand, probably not there. I think there's a huge desire, and I think that consumers' sentiment is they want to travel, but wanting to travel and pulling the trigger, I think, are different things. And I and there are a couple of factors that I think it's important for the industry to think about. Uh, in terms of sort of the reality check of where we really are. Um, you know, when we look at, and I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit to the e economics of things, um, with, you know, 33 million people uh, losing jobs over the course of the last little while, and, uh, and, and we talk about reopening, we need to think about the reemergence of those jobs really in stages. Um, as businesses that provide services, whether they are uh, ski hills or hotels or restaurants or bars, everything is going to be operating at a lower capacity, which requires fewer people in the workforce. And, and that changes rehiring practices. And there, it, it, we've also got employers now who are burning through cash and have to figure out, you know, what's first, the consumer or the staff? And where's that balancing point that you can afford them? So I, I worry about that and all things being equal, were we to have consumers confident in their health and safety as they travel tomorrow, I still don't think that that would be the silver bullet to get those 33 million people back and traveling. And the, the, the reason I keep going back to employment is because people get cash defensive. Discretionary spend is one of the first things to go under these conditions. And so I, I worry that, that we as an industry are, we're looking for bright spots, we're looking for openings, but I think that a protracted process mm -hmm. is absolutely in our future. And we, we don't have anything that we, we need to frame everything up with the expectation that this is gonna take longer than we hope it will. Not, not the funnest message to convey, but I think an important one. Yeah, I, I agree, Tom, and I think you're seeing um, you know, a lot of businesses talking about a phased reopening and thinking and prioritizing various customer segments. Um, and I think that speaks a little bit to what Pete's observation from his data was about some of the younger travelers wanting to um, take advantage of deals or come back sooner maybe than older travelers. And that may depend on your destination. Um, you know, certainly we're hearing a lot of destinations talking about outreach to second homeowners and having that as a key group to come back, kind of one of the initial groups to return, um, but also balancing that with the concerns of your local residents. And, and there was a lot of pushback, obviously for a few months ago uh, when this was first starting to happen about whether it was appropriate to have second homeowners versus local residents and what's the right mix there. And so I think destinations have to be pretty careful about sending out messages that, hey, we're open and we want you to come back maybe it's it's a more nuanced phased approach obviously large activities and groups and larger um, events and festivals are, are not going to be happening um, in the near term but but what's your plan to phase those back in at some point in the future um, so this phased approach of trying to bring in um, you know maybe your regional drive market first and then the, the fly destination might take a little longer and when exactly that's going to recover we we don't know yet but thinking in in those phases is is probably going to be the most important part yeah yeah i agree with that i mean that's certainly what we saw on the the hospitality lodging side with the last recoveries that leisure led the recovery and that's what we're we're planning for in in this recovery um we've started to on the topic of pent up demand we've looked at states performance of hotels in states that have started to reopen. And we have seen in the past couple of weeks, higher weekend occupancy um, compared to weekday, which we would say is leisure travelers um, who are anxious to get out and drive to markets um, are certainly gonna be a big piece. But I, I agree with the long road to a recovery. Um, at STR for 2020, we're forecasting a 50% rev par decline for, um, for this year and that 
even next year, we're not back up to 2019 performance levels. Uh, so it's going to be a long road to recovery. I, I think so. Talking about the recovery, I think one of the interesting pieces that will be uh, that that we all will follow is what what will the impact be on supply and in particular. And we saw this in in you know late 2019 as we analyzed the a study that we did on short-term rental was the long tail of the rental by owner market was being phased out. They were being crushed because there was much more of a convergence in supply as, you know, consolidation in the market and property managers were starting to manage more units and the the kind of unsophisticated rental by owner. I, I think this, this crisis will, will only intensify that, that, that sort of, second homeowner that that rents their property uh you know they they won't be able to compete from a security and a safety perspective i think that's going to be a real challenge uh as we kind of you know we see it in our consumer sentiment data uh, that safety security that is really really big and it will be we know that until a, a vaccine comes so it'll be interesting to see how you know property managers while they're certainly challenged right now and sarah Sarah Bradford made a an interesting comment in the chat that said uh, rates are staying the same because nobody is booking. They don't go down. Nobody's <laughs> just nobody's booking. So fair point there. But I, I think yeah. it'll be really interesting to see what happens on that. On the supply yeah, and, and actually, to Sarah's point, that 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 is valid. Uh, the reason that we mentioned it is because during the last uh, big shock event, uh, the very first thing that happened was rates plummeted, uh, and there was a race to the bottom. Right, and in this case, we've actually got an opportunity to contemplate rate, to avoid that situation happening. But back back to what you were talking about with supply, Pete. Um, you know, I I think that there are there's a lot of dynamism, obviously, in the the non hotel side of the inventory because, of course, as we came out of 2008 we saw a lot of the dynamism around the rent by owner marketplace and how it was competing with and interacting with and, and becoming a disruptor to the vacation rental industry. Now that it's sort of normalized and become a normal practice, I think that's a little bit different. But what we do see is that there is, you know, a significant amount of inventory in mountain communities that is owned by second homeowners. And were we to see a prolonged economic uh, uh, recession come out of this, second homes are, are often the first thing to go uh, from somebody's holdings. And if those were to wind up back bank owned uh, or, or become the primary home of people who are using the second home on the market, that will deplete inventory, certainly. And, and the other part of which uh, Ali is probably a better expert is pipeline which dried up completely as banks pulled back on funding in 2008, nine and whether or not, I don't know, Ali, is there any indication about what banks are doing with new construction on hotels? We haven't. Yeah, it's a great question. We haven't seen, um, we looked at that very thing for April, um, our pipeline data of whether we're seeing more abandoned or deferred properties. Um, we have seen an increase in the number of abandoned and deferred properties above what we would consider normal, um, but it's not significant as of yet more likely what we're going to see is that those pipeline projects are going to take longer to actually deliver to the market. Um, we know that there's been challenges with supply chain of getting certain hard goods, soft goods out of various countries. Um, so we're, we're likely to see that those projects are extended. Um, there's also some states where construction has not been deemed essential during this period. So just a general slowdown in the pipeline is, is what we're expecting. And then, um, another right. dynamic that um, is, is interesting to be monitoring because it's continuing to evolve is the increasing flexibility that hotels and resorts and, and other businesses are, are allowing their customers, uh, particularly, for example, when it comes to season pass purchases for ski resorts, we are seeing quite a lot of flexibility being offered that was never offered before. And, um, you know, that's a rea obviously a reaction to consumers' concerns and, and resorts wanting to hold on to those customers. Um, so um, historically, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, buying a season pass was sort of a risk because, you know, what if there was a bad snow year or other things? That's just kind of the way that that deal worked. If you bought a season pass ahead of time, you were putting up a little bit of the risk yourself. 
now it feels like the resorts and the hotels are taking on and the airlines even are, are taking on more and more of that risk and telling the customer, hey, we have all these flexible policies now to refund or reschedule or whatever it might be uh, with, the, you know, the short-term rentals have obviously changed um, pretty dramatically with that uh, topic as well. So I think that's an interesting one to keep, keep an eye on as, as this um, response evolves. We, um, we started uh, doing some surveys about 10 weeks ago on a weekly basis. And one of the questions we asked 10 weeks ago was, do you currently have any concessions to your cancellation policy? And at that time, only 33% of properties were making concessions on their cancellation policy. For the last two and a half weeks or three weeks of that uh, survey, it's now been 100%. And uh, the concessions that were being offered 10 weeks ago, it looks like about 48% were actually issuing full refunds. 90% uh, of them are now issuing full refunds or doing some version of full refunds or full credits without any penalty at all. So there's been a real evolution as time has gone on and that seems to be the norm now where everybody is, is doing concessions. Uh, Pete, but last to you, and also from that survey, just back to one of your original points about people not being driven by deals. Um, it, most properties in our survey are actually not even bothering with any promotions related to the downturn right now. Um, for that exact reason. That's reflected in, in some of that ADR stuff we're looking at, but it's also reflected in the fact that it's just not driving visitation. Yeah, no, I, for, for sure. And I think you, you're starting to see some value adds, but I think it, to Dave's point, it, it's much more about being really loose with, with cancellation and, and, uh, and postponing strategies and making sure that you're being customer centric first. And you've seen a real pivot from companies that, that held a, a, a really firm line to start and have completely flip-flopped. And I think they, they, they realize that, that all customers are, uh, are struggling and the ones that can provide the best service at this time will, um, you know, will keep those customers as, as we move into recovery. Um, it, it, the other thing that, that, I, you know, that we look at quite deeply is, is distribution trends. And it'll be really interesting to see um, you know, the, the OTAs were, were quite lenient to begin with on, on giving refunds and hotels were hammered uh, because of it. I'm interested to hear, Ali, your perspective on this. Um, and now as hotels are, you know, essentially down to, you know, single dig digit occupancy, in some ways they can almost rewrite some of their distribution strategies because they're starting from scratch. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see. And this goes for short term rentals as well. I think you know, Airbnb had a lot of backlash from hosts as they were very lenient with their policies. But I suspect that most of those hosts, again, kind of fall into that category of uh, managing less than 10 units and doing it as a hobby. And, you know, you, you start to see factions of them coming together and trying to create new distribution channels, which we know aren't going to last. But I think it, it'll be really interesting to see if we see a change in distributions, if the OTAs are able to, uh, you know, to, to gain some power as they've done through other economic recessions, or if the suppliers are strong and, and can kind of maintain some of the gains that they've made over the last last decade or so. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. Um, on another webinar yesterday, I heard um, someone say that we, it's rare that we have the option to redo an opening of a hotel. And that's exactly what, you know, there was a question in the, the chat about how many hotel rooms are closed in the U.S. That number is 15%. So it's not a huge number. Um, there are a lot of hotels out there just running at very low occupancies, but staying open to be able to have some revenue to hopefully cover some of their debt service. Um, but that opportunity to then rethink what are you doing from a service perspective, what how are you managing your channels? Uh, we know that there's been a push over the past few years to brand.com and really analyzing what is the cost of acquisition of your customer. And this is a good time and opportunity for hotels to really be able to look at all of that when demand starts to come back. Tom, you're on mute. Yeah, I've done it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nice Daffy Duck look. That's good. Uh, uh, we got a, we did get a question in the questions panel from Jessica Morisoli. I hope I didn't butcher your last name, but but it, it's actually a, there's a moral imperative question there. And, and her question is, you know, is it tone deaf to to market travel right now? 
right? And this is something that I actually took a lot of heat for proposing about eight, nine weeks ago, that, you know, is there a moral imperative to actually not be marketing at the moment? Um, I think that, that, that the answer to that changes as time goes on. And, you know, five weeks ago, maybe there was. And as we start to talk about reopening and consumers are expressing a demand or expressing an interest in demand, maybe that changes a little bit. But I'm interested in, in, the, in just the group's thoughts on, you know, how you handle it from um, sort of a messaging point of view and if you're doing harm by doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's tricky. Like you said, there's a balance, um, uh, but the ability now to to segment and target your messaging and maybe um, sticking your toe in the water with certain customer segments of yours uh, first and not going out super broadly with, with a, a big message and being, being very tactical about who you're talking to and what that message is, is really the way to go. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there there's more and more ways to, to micro target advertising today and and you see some of the nimble brands out already uh, the message has to be empathetic at this point i think that's one thing that's clear is is it's not about come to our destination and look at all the amazing stuff we have it's i know it's a tough time i you know there's a lot of creativity in the dmo space about trying to use virtual tools and technology to help people experience things that, you know, that are, are really interesting. Um, so I, I think the big, you know, Google AdWords, you know, you look at Expedia and, and booking, they're, they're cutting their, their Google spend by 80% uh, this year because they know that, you know, consumers aren't, uh, aren't kind of, you know, clicking through and, and, and buying uh, based on ad spend right now. Um, and, you know, I, I think you'll see as, as we move forward that there is some pent up demand. So there's a need to go out and grab it. It's just being really smart about how you target your ads and who you target them to and, and making sure that you're not, uh, you're not, you're not kind of throwing out mass messages that, that, that could be mis misperceived. Yeah. I've heard some, um, some health and well-being marketing out there. Right, it's time to get away and relax and and try to uh, you know unwind from what's going on. And this might not be a bad place to do it, sort of thing. Very, as you say, very soft and gentle marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just looking at uh, looking through a couple of the questions here. Um, and one of them is, you know, would people prefer a VRBO rental versus a hotel? And we talked about that and touched on it a few minutes ago. Um, I actually think that th there's an opportunity, and, and I say VRBO, but I think we're talking about um, places Short without common, yeah. private, private homes and detached uh, residences that don't have common areas uh, so that people can do sort of a, <clears throat> an isolation travel sort of thing. And, and I think there's a, a, you know, valid argument to be made that that could actually um, be to the advantage of that segment of the lodging industry. Um, but to your point, Pete, you know, can they keep up with the need to provide health and safety and, and a sense of, you know, safe travel? Um, I don't know, Ali, if you are hearing anything from your clients about um, some sort of chain-wide standard or what is the gold standards that, that's being established at the big hotel chains around, um, around hygiene are they are they putting in place protocols that they can start rating and promoting really heavily or we've seen a lot of hotel companies in the, the past few weeks come out with their standards um, as they're trying to you know the top concern here being health and safety that is in all travelers minds is how can i be assured that the hotel room that i check into is 100% clean. There was no one in there right before I checked in, even making sure that, you know, no housekeeping supervisor was in there to make sure that it was um, clean properly. I can guarantee that it's 100% clean. Um, so we've seen Hilton come out with their clean room, partnering with Lysol and um, Marriott as well. Wynn put out a very lengthy document on all of their standards. Um, so we're seeing that as the new standard of what to expect from hotel companies. To, to really go the, the extra distance to make sure we feel comfortable as, tra as travelers staying in their hotels. Um, so I think they're 
there's potentially an advantage there for hotels over um, short-term rentals, um, just with the, the brand power that they have to be able to roll out those initiatives and marketing power. Um, so I think as travelers are considering isolating in a short-term rental, um, certainly a, a concern there is making sure that it is clean. Will we see an increase in cleaning fees? Um, you know, things like that will be top of mind. Does anybody else on the call think there's a place for a governing body of some sort or an overarching organization like AAA to, you know, an equivalent to the five-star rating uh, to apply across the non-hotel industry that standardizes processes around cleaning? Does that, is that a part of our future? You know, I, I think maybe, maybe near-term future, but it, it, it's always you know, I, I'm hesitant to overreact because we've seen as travels recovered through the 9-11 crisis, as well as through yeah. the Great Recession, there's been, um, you know, there's been, there's been that initial period uh, of shock and awe, and that's been recovered, you know, as, as we've kind of gone beyond, you've seen some normalization of it. Um, so, I'm not sure that anything like that, that's going to really stick. I think what will stick, and again, this back to my point about professionalization of supply and, and kind of that long tail of rental by owner being really challenged is I do think in the short term, people that are renting, you know, opting to rent short term properties to your point, Ali, are likely going to choose the ones that they perceive to be the most clean. And I think the property management companies and um, you know, even the, some of the virtual property management companies that have arrived on the on the scene in the last, you know, five five to to seven years, Turnkey, Evolve, those types of companies that have many units that they work with, they can kind of put together their own standards and and put a little bit of ease into the minds of travelers that that they understand that cleanliness is important and and you know I think that's gonna that's gonna continue to kind of intensify that trend. Yeah, just one one sort of related comment um, that I've been thinking about uh, really briefly is that that there is a component of of mountain traveler that stays with a family member or a friend who lives in the local area, um, and is that how is that going to recover? Our our local residents going to want to host visitors from out of town if they're concerned about um, you know contracting. A virus are, are uh, you know, the, the grandparents hosting the grandchildren has been a dynamic that we've seen a lot. And is that something that's going to going to pause for at least a little while and, and keep those those that dynamic of the lodging uh, component of the overall mountain travel industry? You know, how is that going to play out? Well, and there, I think there's a there's a bigger question there of, about, you know, sort of a NIMBY pushback. Um, there are DMOs that are hearing from locals that they don't want people visiting their town right now, even though the economy is dependent upon it. And overcoming that, I think, is first and foremost. But you're right. You know, do, do grandparents want the kids, you know, or the grandkids coming up and staying when who knows where the grandkids have been? And if they're going back to school, uh, that's a, a, an even larger concern. So, you know, I, I think <clears throat> those are things that we worry about. But, you know, I, I, I think Kat's telling us that we're getting close to time. But what I wanted to mention was, you know, when we think about mountain travelers, when I think about mountain travelers after, you know, 20 years of doing this, it's pretty clear that they're a pretty dedicated group of people, right? They, they love the mountains. They love ski. They are skiers. They are snowboarders. Uh, they're, they're going to come visit in a good snow year. It's a matter of finding a way to accommodate that. And this segment of the industry, I think, is blessed to some degree with a consumer who functions above normal consumer confidence has more disposable income, is really passionate about what they do, and might create an opportunity for a slightly accelerated return, provided that it can be done safely. Um, you know, the, that's, that's sort of a closing thought that I've got as I look at the landscape ahead. Yeah, that's a great, great point, Tom. Great, thanks guys. So I'm gonna take it back over so we um, wrap up on time. Thank you so much for that wonderful discussion. I think there were a lot of great points that were made and, and hopefully it was extremely helpful to our um, audience. I just, again, want to thank our presenters 
from today and uh, got their contact information up on the screen in case anybody wants to reach out to them individually with any sort of follow-up. Um, we, we were able to answer uh, the majority of the questions that came in either live throughout the discussion or um, via individual chat. So thank you guys for managing that so fluidly. Uh, so uh, with that, I would just like to announce our next webinar, which will be in uh, two weeks. We'll be back on the 29th with a webinar titled To Ski or Not to Ski, where Ted Sullivan, the Vice President of Destination Analytics with Adara, will be with us uh, talking about uh, using data to understand the mountain traveler. So. Thanks everyone for joining us and thank you again to our panelists and just a last reminder to uh, take the survey at the end of the, the webinar, but I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks and be safe. Thanks Kat, see ya. Thanks guys. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, it was fun. <laughs>